we thought we'd roll out a once-in-a-lifetime business opportunity. Music. Inter. Worldwide. 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 Inter. Worldwide. Ciao, buongiorno a tutti ragazzi. Un saluto di Inter Worldwide. And it's a first. It's an exclusive. I can't believe I'm saying this. I've had many people on before, but this is the first Juventini on the Inter Worldwide podcast. I don't know what's going on, man, but Alberto, thank you for joining me, brother. First of all, how are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it is a, a little bit strange, I must say. I was uh, surprised uh, to get that uh, message, but uh, I appreciate everyone that puts out content for their uh, fan bases, so I'm happy to take part. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. And I think during this time at the moment, what it's done is restore that little bit of humility um, left in the human humanity as well, especially when it comes to football. Um, first of all, Alberto, before we get into the questions, which telling some of our listeners i'm not too sure how many juventus fans are listening but would you mind telling them a little bit what you guys do at the old juve cast yeah for sure essentially um i started the uh podcast um this is my second season running it now and um it's just a uh platform for uh all fans as i invite uh any and all uh juventini to come on and uh share their opinions and uh let their voice be heard and that's all it is we just talk about uh news surrounding the club surrounding syria our rivals and uh we have fun we do post-match podcast um and recaps and yeah it's just good it's just been uh, an avenue no matter how big or small the account is i just have any and all guests uh who want to um yeah, come on the show and be a guest. So it's been a lot of fun. And I've met a ton of Juventini all over the world. It's really awesome, isn't it? I've done something similar, man. I started at the start of last season and just was looking for an extra hobby and outlet for my love for culture and Inter. And before you know it, it became a weekly thing. And all this involvement from fans all around the world, it's an awesome thing you're doing and an awesome fan that any, uh, sorry, an awesome thing that anyone's doing in the world of culture, connecting all the fans together. So thank you once again. We'll jump right into the questions because I'm mindful of time. Um, so I've got four Four to five different questions for Alberto. Maybe two of them will be similar, so we'll see how we go. First of all, Alberto, how do you think Juventus has reacted to the stopping of the season during COVID, and how do you expect them to return to form when we do start kicking a ball again? Oh, man. Um, <clears throat> I mean, as far as how they handled it, I mean, essentially it's been kind of dictated, right, uh, by government officials and the league and whatnot. But, I mean, I think they've... They've all done their part. I mean, they had their uh, regimen for players to do what they could uh, from home um, in, as far as training goes and whatnot. But we, you and I both know that's not the same. Um, you know, home training is only uh, so effective, um, completely different than being with the squad and at the facilities. And what a huge interruption, uh, 26 games into the league, right? Um, right tight tight race uh, at the top there obviously with us and Lazio so uh, I don't know how do I expect them to get back into form I, it's it, it's gonna be pretty pretty tough to expect them to uh, not show rust let's put it that way um, we were already in a transition uh, obviously being uh, Maurizio Sarri's first season and I felt like the whole thing, like not that there's ever a good time, obviously, for a <laughs> pandemic, but uh, it felt like he was just starting to figure out uh, who were his key cogs and, uh, you know, obviously made a big, uh, of course, our clubs played in the last match uh, before uh, everything got shut down. And uh, he made a bit of a statement there by benching uh, Miralem Pjanic for uh, Bentancur, and it felt like uh, he was starting to figure out uh, which guys he needed to go with. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would echo most of your thoughts. Um, do you have anything else to add? Sorry if I interrupted. Uh, no, you didn't interrupt. No, um, that's that's really it. I mean, we've seen uh, the Bundesliga start up and uh, you can tell um, the guys haven't played in uh, some time. Um, yes. You know, so I think it's going to be the same uh, for Syria. I mean, I think we're coming on to the crunch decision day, right? Which I heard was May 28th. So... At that day, I guess we'll find out uh, pretty quick if they are going to proceed with June 13th or 14th being the start of the matches again. Um, there's also been a lot of rumors about a playoff. Um, the playoff, well, that's a whole other uh, topic there. But, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. All right, second question. This is basically in your own opinion, Alberto. So not the opinion of, you know, from a Juventus perspective, whether it benefits or not, but in your personal opinion, should the Serie A season restart, yes or no? There's a lot of variables. It's a very hard question. In a yes or no, I mean, oof, it's tough. I mean, if they, yeah, if they, yeah. Can, if they could come up with the answers to the questions that are going to be asked throughout, I would say yes. Uh, figure out a way to play out the matches and uh, get it done. Um, I think altering everything you know, like doing playoffs or shortening uh, a shorter amount of games to finish up. I think Serie A, personally, I just I don't think should have an asterisk next to a champion. Um, yeah. So I think they just the league in its own just can't really afford to, and they need to uh, kind of just make this happen. But from watching, you know, Bundesliga go and whatnot, and there's you know UFC going on and whatnot. I, I think. We should be able to as well um, and do so with the proper precautions. But again, there's going to be a lot of questions that are asked, like what if a star player from a club um, gets hit with the virus? Yeah. Um, what an unfair advantage. How do you even approach that? Um, you, so if you're going to do something for one club, it's got to be the same uh, for all of them. And I just, how do you not get an asterisk if all of a sudden uh, – you know, Lazio loses uh, Immobile or, you know, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's it's a tough one. They, they're going to need to have those answers prior to actually doing so. And I, I don't think they do right now. So it'll, it'll be interesting one way or another. But do I think they should? I think they should. They should at least attempt to, yeah. Yeah, great answer, man. And just quickly before we move on to the third question, um, if you were to decide it, is there any particular structure or format you would choose to go with? I'll just mention before we ask that, you know, we're on the Cultural Connection podcast this week and one of the guests mentioned that, you know, maybe we could have it. Um, I know that the Serie A has come out and said there could be a six-way elimination. We all disagreed with that. It didn't make sense for Napoli and Roma, who were chasing the pack by 24, 26 points respectively, for them to get the equal opportunity at a playoff. For me personally, I would still like to see Inter involved, obviously, even if it was just a playoff between Inter, Lazio, Juventus, Atalanta. Um, even if they wanted to go further than that and make it almost like a, a Champions League group, for the top three or four, and in which each team plays each other home and away. I also wouldn't be completely opposed to Juventus and Lazio just having a one-off one off game because they're both worthy. What really irked me was the thought of Roma and Napoli getting a crack at it. What would be your ideal structure and format to go back to, Alberto? I'd have to uh, agree with you. Um, you know, those clubs being so far out, I don't think should be in the mix whatsoever. Um yeah, I mean, you have to draw the line somewhere, right? Um, some sort of, sort of uh, point uh, gap and make the call there uh, if you were going to do a playoff. Um, again, for me personally, I think you find a way to play the matches, even if you have to maybe shorten. Obviously, it's going to be a short off season, regardless, right? But Maybe uh, next season, you know, you scrap uh, winter break and stuff and just start looking at other alternatives going into the next season. But I think you try and get the matches in. Yeah, um, yeah. Personally, um, I think that's the way to go. Otherwise, yeah, absolutely. Uh, really, uh, no, yeah. All, all good. It's, it's so confusing, brother. Like, honestly, we have all these different variables, as you said, and Italy, you know, I think I speak for most people when I say that Italy's efficiency just isn't on the level of Germany's, and I don't think that they're going to get a plan together quick enough. But, you know, as Alberto and myself and everybody else will find out soon enough, that, that crunch day is coming up. In fact, we, it may even happen before we get this podcast out. So, you know, stay in your loop, stay in your sources. I'm sure we've got some news coming out soon. Third yeah. question. Third question for my awesome guest today is, are there any players in your club that have tested positive or has the whole cl um, club now tested negative? And how do you think the situation with testing will play out once the season resumes, especially for those clubs who don't necessarily have the facilities, mate? If something goes wrong at Allianz, if something goes wrong at the Sun Seed, or even if something goes wrong for Napoli or Roma, they'll have the resources there to make do. But a lot of a lot of the smaller clubs in Serie A, and now especially if you're going to talk about it trickling down to the under divisions, 
they're going to find it really hard. So I guess, Alberto, my question to you is, long story short, what do you think the impact is going to have on the smaller clubs after you talk a little bit about the impact on the squad of Juventus? Yeah, like uh, as far as our club goes, um, the only players that have been confirmed uh, that had it that are now recovered were um, Blaise Matuidi, uh, Daniele Rugani, and Paolo Di Pala. Um, that's about it for the club. Um, Paolo Di Bala was the longest um, to get to the recovered stage. Um, and he spoke on it uh, pretty intensely about uh, what he was going through. And it's kind of alarming that, uh, you know, a fit 25, 26 year old like that would get, uh, you know, hit so hard with it, right? Um, but we are, we have yet to see the effects yet, right? Um, I know they're going through group training now and the clubs brought back their players and certain players that were traveling back into Italy had to undergo their um, isolation period, um, which I mean is all you can really do. So the club's doing everything they really can. They've tested the players on return. Um, but I mean, still, these players that uh, are in the recovery stage, I'd still be curious about has it affected their lungs whatsoever, you know? Um, and again, this goes back into, are they going to be uh, match fit in time? Um, are there going to be any other effects from it? Um, a lot of question marks still, right? Uh, but I yeah. think the team, yeah, has handled it well. I think I agree with you. The bigger clubs will uh, be able to um, make adjustments, adapt, and be able to handle situations. The smaller clubs... I don't really know uh, resource-wise. I mean, I think they'll be able to do what they need to. Um, everyone's got to follow the same protocol. Um, what uh, concerns me is that, again, going back to the statement you made, will the league be organized enough? Um, and, again, just have those uh, answers ready because it's kind of strange. I mean, I've been watching uh, the football that's resumed and I mean, you're trying to keep social distance on the benches and the celebrations. Yet when you play the game, it's a contact sport. You just can't get away from it, right? The thing with Syria that concerns me is that I heard that after this group training period, after the go-ahead's given, that they literally said, um, it's a minimal amount of cases and they will shut it down completely. So again, they're not that ready. Feels, that almost feels inevitable. To yeah. Me. It's almost like we're looking at doomsday on the horizon because yeah, things are easing up a little bit over in Italy, but they're definitely not easing up to the point that we can avoid um, more cases, especially if there's that much contact. And we're not just talking about physical contact. We're talking about your sporting environment in general. You sweat, you share locker rooms, water bottles get thrown around like coins. It's, you know, I'm sure you've spent just as much time on a football pitch or a locker room as I have. It's not exactly the most hygienic environment. So I would definitely agree with you when I say it's almost inevitable, Alberto, that we're going to have a case in the league when the league starts, do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I feel that way for sure. I think it's good. It's inevitable that we'll get at least one. And my, you know, it starts to, and this gets back to that question, you know, yes or no. I mean, yes, I think they should start to play the games. But, I mean, if they're going to be that strict with the rules and regulations of going through it, I almost start to wonder why would they put clubs through that and the players and everyone involved if they're going to be that, you know, strict about it um, I because I feel it's inevitable. So I don't, I, I don't really know. There's really no, it's unprecedented times, right? So there really is no right or wrong. I mean, you just got to um, make a decision and kind of go towards it and, you know, have the best answers possible to any situations that could arise. But I mean, to expect it to go on when we have another 12 matches, some teams have 13 without getting a case. I mean, no, I, I can't see that happening. 
Yeah, I would have to agree. And that sort of moves into our fourth question here. What are the final financial impacts on your club? Um, you know, obviously for a club like Juventus and even Inter, the financial imp impacts and implications on this are not that heavy. Let's just put that into context for a second in the grand scheme of things. Um, so first of all, what are the financial impacts on Juventus? But more importantly, Alberto, do you think the FIGC should be doing more to assist the smaller clubs staying afloat? Yeah, so... Um, the impacts on uh, UV so far, uh, from what I've seen, are about uh, 122 million in the negative. So they've lost about 122 million in revenue so far, and that is factoring into account the uh, 90 million euros that they saved with the players taking uh, wage cuts. Okay. Um, so it's substantial. Is it yes. something that Juve can't uh, recoup or whatnot? Uh, I mean, no. I mean, in the long run, um, yeah, it's going to hurt them. Um, it's going to hurt them in the market. Uh, all the teams are going to feel that. Um, so we're going to hit uh, a market, you know, we'll get into that, I'm sure. But um, yeah, it's going to affect them. It's nothing drastic. Should the FIGC do something to assist the smaller clubs? Absolutely. I think uh, it's, uh, I think even almost there is a little bit of an obligation to the bigger clubs to do something to assist where everyone should pool in and uh, get the assistance because ultimately without the other clubs, there is no league and that doesn't benefit anybody. Um, so I think they should be working on something to assist um, all the clubs, right? Um, Absolutely. But, but yeah, those small clubs, I mean, we need them. Without them, there's no league. And it's one of the things with Syria in general. I mean, um, you know, you and I will know that it's uh, very, very much up there near the top. Uh, it is, in my opinion, uh, when you consider the top five leagues. I just think when it comes to marketing uh, and production value is where they drop off. But, I would agree uh, for sure. Sorry, I'm going to cut you off because it was a very, very good point you just made, man. In terms of tactics and tactability, we always say this on the Inter Worldwide podcast, we all still value the Serie A as the best league in the world, as the most high-quality footballing league in the world. But in terms of marketing and advertising, they're way off the pace, aren't they, mate? Yeah, big time. Um, and production, you know, I mean, uh, where I'm at, uh, there's a lot of Premier League fans. And to me, I just, I can't, I can't really take it. And <laughs> it's overhyped and it's, it's <laughs> you watch it on TV, the colors are pretty, the noise is uh, amplified and they just make it, it's a spectacle, right? And people just kind of buy into it. But when it's it, like true, if you understand the game of football and you watch it, there's not a lot of substance to it. Yeah. Um, Whereas, uh, you know, and how many times have we seen, you know, uh, great scorers come to Syria and they struggle? And I mean, hell, even uh, an alien like uh, CR7 felt it, you know? Yeah. Um, so um, it, it's just, it's, it's a great league. I think we need to assist all the clubs. We need to do what's best for the league itself. I think uh, it, it, the best thing that could happen for it is we need to get back to the old days where, you know, this year was fantastic, you know? Um, you guys got uh, Conte and whatnot, but you were right, you were right in the thick of things. Lazio, Lazio's right. Yeah. Like, it, it's an incredible league, and it's so unfortunate that the whole thing got shut down because it was literally one of the best seasons I've watched in a long time. Yeah. Uh, there, yeah. Was a lot of, there was a lot of momentum this season, man, and, you know, it's something that all Serie A fans, whether you support um, the Bianconeri or the Nerazzurri or the Rossoneri, no matter who you support, everybody has one interest in getting culture and Serie A football back to the summit of world football where it belongs. So I'm really looking forward to it improving. I would agree with Alberto when he says that it was really disappointing that it came to an end. I would agree, but I, I do think that our um, Italian football can go up from here providing that it deals with this whole COVID thing properly. I mean, we were on the right track, but this sort of thing seems like the kind of thing that could really defer a country like Italy back down into the pits just because of their lack of planning and whatnot. But as we've said before, we'll just see what happens. Thanks to Alberto. The last question's coming up. It's going to be a good one. It's a big one. We'll probably dwell on it a little bit longer. Coming up to what is going to be most likely the strangest Mercato I've ever witnessed as a football fan. How do you predict the transfer market goes for Juventus, and what is it that that you would, uh, what is it that you expect to see happen, and what you would like to happen, mate? Yeah, so um, it, it's funny. Um, this has been 
the craziest one for rumors um, for as long as I can remember, um, you know, in a season where the football isn't even being played currently. But uh, it's kind of expected um, because of the pandemic. And it makes sense because teams are trying to cover their bases, right? Um, every A lot of sporting directors have just been open about the fact that this particular Mercado will end up being a lot of swap deals. Um, when deals are made, there'll be very, very few deals. I think you'll see that are straight cash deals. Um, us, you and Tini, we like to, uh, you know, uh, dream big and, you know, make all these statements about all these players that we're linked to. Um, and I would love that. I would love to, uh, you know, get a forward, get a right back, uh, maybe make a change at left back, uh, get a couple midfielders. But honestly, I probably wouldn't be surprised with, a swap deal within Italy, um, maybe for one of Roma's two players, um, and then making that deal with some of our younger uh, Italians and swap there. Maybe one outright purchase, uh, possibly uh, the player um, uh, your club and my club are battling for, Tonali, maybe as one outright purchase. Um, maybe another deal with uh, an elite player, which will be one or two players swapped and some money. I think, honestly, it's probably going to be two moves, three moves maximum. Um, not as many uh, for you as uh, people are thinking. What I would like to see, uh, I mean, we, we like to talk about all this dead weight that we have getting moved, but I think this pandemic kind of shut the door on that. We'll probably yeah. have to... We'll have to take our lumps on uh, probably Kadir and just buy that contract out, which is fine. Uh, needs to happen. But um, of the guys that we feel we need to get rid of, like Douglas Costa, Bernardeschi, I don't think we're going to get rid of both. I could see one of them going, not both. One will stay. Um, what about your midfield, man? Um, I'm just going to come out and say it right now. I hate Adrian Rabio with a passion, man. That guy's a snake, and his type of footballer needs to pretty much retire. I think that if he doesn't work out well for you guys, um, yeah, it's Saint and Nice or Lil for him in the not too distant future. Uh, what are your thoughts on Rabio, man? Were you happy when you signed him, or did you see it for what it was, just a liability? I was happy with a little bit of. Uh nervousness i guess uh yeah. you know with uh, his background's been you know um it, it's been out in the open for a long time i mean deschamps didn't want him with france uh, and that psg has been sitting for so long right yeah. um but you know he's he's a good player with us he's he the warning signs were there he started the season in the preseason he was fantastic he was amazing you could see the skill there but then at the start of the season, sorry, doing the right thing, in my opinion, went with the core just to keep it safe, I think, because we had a tricky start to the schedule. Um, I think we had Napoli in match two. Uh, we started off against Parma, which is always a tough fixture for us. Um, and he played it safe, and he went with Matuidi, Pjanic, and Kadir, and it worked. Uh, but Rabio, it wasn't too long after, about a month in, and you could hear like reports coming out of him unhappy with his playing time. And I was like, Oh, here we go. You know, and little signs like that. And it seems to always be these players that have family members and not agents, you know, right. like, what is with players that have family members as agents? They're always issues. It's crazy to me. Get it's it horrible, down. man. Mixing business with pleasure is one of the oldest, oldest quotes in the book. You don't do it. Yeah, so Rabio, I mean, now with the reports, him getting heavily linked, I mean, I'm I'm fine with it, to be honest, if he had to go. Uh, when Ramsey got slotted into Metzala for us, he was uh, miles ahead. Um, he's got his injury woes, but as far as I go, it's always quality on the pitch that I'll take before that. Injuries are going to happen. Um, it is what it is, but Rabio with all those little warning signs, I'd be okay with him to leave. And if he's part of a deal to bring back Paul Pogba, I'm like 120% for it. Yeah, absolutely. So I was going to say, if you were to pick one signing that your club is rumoured to, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Juventus are always linked with half of the market. But is Pogba, yeah. your, is Pogba your main squeeze, bro? Is that you want to come back? Or would you be would you prefer Tonali? I mean, they've got about seven or eight years, um, I think seven years in between them. But, you know, See, Pogba, yeah. 
Yeah, the the thing is, Tonali, I think, I don't think that deal affects the Pogba move. Um, like, Tonali, you know, as a deep-line playmaker would be fantastic. Pogba's that uh, left-sided midfielder that needs the freedom to kind of go up and attack. Um, so a couple different styles. I Ideally, man, <laughs> I'd love to see them both. Um uh, but uh, yeah, Pogba. I like Pogba. Um, there's a lot of Juventini that are against him coming back, um, and you know it's his attitude, his Instagramming, stuff like that. What he did with the number ten when he had it with us, you know, drawing on a felt with it plus five, and just doing weird things, and then talking about being on vacation, and now he's going back home when he went to Manchester. Um, yeah. I think he realized he made a mistake. At the end of the day, Manchester United is getting a little bit of handcuffed and they've lost their leverage. And I think now's the time to pounce on that because if you take a look at Pogba on his day, in my opinion, he is elite on his day. Um, I think people underrate his uh, defensive uh, play as well because if you look at Manchester United, when they had him in the lineup, uh, everybody wants to talk about him doing poor for Manchester United, but... I disagree. Um, Their goals for and their goals against both big time affected with him not in the lineup. Um, And the other thing is, you and Tini are thinking, you know, Milinkovic, Savic, or these other guys. First of all, Milinkovic, Savic, to me, um, you got to think Lazio plays with a five man midfield. Okay, so he's got the freedom to press um, all the time in that system and that setup. Um, when he played in the World Cup, he wasn't in a five-man midfield, and he was almost invisible. Uh, if he comes to Juve, it's a three-man midfield. He's not going to get that freedom. Can he do it? I don't really know. Pogba's accustomed to a three-man midfield. Um, and Pogba's uh, he's a game-breaker. He, he can be on a poor performance and change it like that uh, with one key pass that he can just carve up a D with. Um, and where else right now with Manchester United handcuffed, are you going to get a player of that caliber for, you know, roughly, well, it's going to be probably less than a hundred mil, right? So I, I started looking at options that are comparable. It's going to be a lot more to get those guys. Lazio will not make a move for Milinkovic Savage to Juve without a ridiculous number pandemic or not. Right. Um, Juventini got a little hyped up about a little interview with Kevin De Bruyne. De Bruyne's going to be 120 minimum. Um, I just think right now, for the bang for your buck, as far as elite guys go, Pogba would be the deal to make, especially if you can offload one of our free transfers like Rabio. I think it's a no brainer. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Thanks for answering that. Um, I did want to say just one more thing before we head off. Where do you stand on Pjanic uh, heading off? Did you want to keep him or does it all kind of depend on which midfielder comes in? I think um, Pjanic for the salary that he makes on our club and the it's I know sorry tried to play it off as a slump throughout this season, but the problem is is that it's been a steady decline for a couple seasons now. He just has lost it, and we need to realize that. We put him, he's always been a makeshift regista. He's not a true regista. We took him from Roma, and we put him in that place there. And He did the trick for a bit, but it's kind of caught up to him now. And I think making him swap for Pjanic uh, would be fine. It just has to be the right swap. This Arthur one makes me nervous because of Arthur's reluctance to come. Um, he's literally said nothing about Juve, not a single word. And I just think like he's almost acting as if he's getting, uh, you know, um, transferred to a Serie B squad or something. You know what I mean? Um, it, it's unbelievable. And there's another uh, player with a uh, family member as an agent. So, um, well, Jorge Mendez is there, but his parents or his dad at least is heavily involved or whatnot. But, I just I think if a player is that reluctant, I'm kind of nervous uh, about bringing him in. So maybe go the Jorginho route with Pjanic, but I can't see Pjanic wanting to go to the Premier League. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well said, man. Well, that's pretty much all we've got for the debut episode with Interconnecting with a Juventini. I don't know if it's ever been done on a public podcast before, but it's here now. (laughs) Um, But once again, Alberto, um, thanks a lot for coming on, man. And you know what? It was such a good chat. When our teams do actually do battle again, um, I think we can tee something up. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'd be uh, all for that when uh, we play again. All right, awesome. So thank you for coming on, Alberto, and you take care. You take care as well. Thank you again. No problem. And from all of us here at Inter Worldwide, Forza Inter. Ciao, guys.